some years ago, I met the gentleman who owns this engine, and it turned out he, he lives in a castle. And of course, he invited me around to have a look at it. You know. It isn't really a castle as most people know. It's really a big, beautiful country house that's built to look like a castle. It's got battlements and everything, but it's never really been under siege. Its owner is James Harvey Bathurst. We got friendly, really, because he's a dedicated traction engine enthusiast and railway enthusiast. Yeah, had to stop. yeah, I've had that happen to me. I helped him restore one of his favourite engines, Atlas, which of course once resided in the north of England around Manchester, but now it lives here on the forecourt of Eastner Castle. Here we are in the Great Hall at Eastner Castle, but to me it looks a lot more comfy than a proper castle. You know, castles are cold, drafty places, and this is quite lovely and comfortable. And of course, James is here, the owner, who's going to tell us all about it and, you know, how it all came about. Isn't that right, Jim? Yeah, well, it's a bit surprising, <laughs> isn't it? Because it, mm. it, it does look like a castle from the mm. distance. And that was the yeah. point. In 1800, a lot of people were looking back to the mm. medieval times. And my family had been here mm. for about 200 years. And they thought this is the time to show everybody that we're a really old family mm. and put up a really impressive buildings. Mm. And, uh, Revival castles. This is a Norman revival castle. Seems to be a bit of the fashion. I mean, it's the the sheer size of this room to impress people. Eh? It's incredibly impressive. Yeah, yeah. So this pretend castle was never really put to the test in war. Real castles had a much more serious purpose. The reason they were built was to keep attacking armies out. So how did something as functional as a castle turn into something as ornate as this? In this series we're going to look at how things and why things were built and what sort of tools and materials were used. And how buildings were adapted and altered to meet changing needs. We'll be visiting some of my favourite ancient castles, cathedrals and great houses, as well as more modern things like bridges, tunnels and other great engineering marvels. All of them are very different in style and purpose, but what they all have in common for me is the great range of craft skills that went into designing, building and decorating them. From the remains of some of our most mysterious and ancient monuments right up to the shiny futuristic structure like Lloyd's Building in London, the skills of architects and builders are there to be seen. But I'm starting off by going to see something very simple. Man's most basic need was to defend himself and our earliest defensive constructions were great earthworks like the outer banks and ditches that surround Old Sarum in Wiltshire. This huge earthworks were built like in the Iron Age, you know, 500 years BC. It sort of defies all wonder when you think that they have no machinery or anything, you know, it were built by the basic tools and muscle power. I mean, when you think to, to actually get up there where the defenders were, you'd got to come up this banking over here with whatever you were going to throw at them, which wouldn't be a lot because you'd be knackered by the time you got up here. Then you've got to descend into the valley with the wrath of them men up there throwing great rocks at you maybe. And then of course attempt to get up. It must have been a pretty, you know, impossible place to take. And when you think all that time ago, you know, long time ago, like the forerunner of a castle. But it was all pretty basic. If you want to see real engineering skills on a truly grand scale, you have to wait for the Romans. When the Romans came to Britain, they brought with them a far more sophisticated building techniques than what we'd ever had before, you know. Adrian's Wall here is the biggest monument that the Roman Empire left behind for us. It stretches right across northern England from Bullness on the Solway Firth to Wall's End on Tyne. Its purpose was to stop the marauding Scotsmen getting across the border. 
or as Adrian put it, to stop the barbarians getting towards the Romans. And work started in the year of 122 AD and it took six years to build, you know. I mean, they worked bloody hard, you know, it's an amazing piece of work. You can't help but notice how the quality of it all varies, you know, as you go from area to area. Some places the stonework just follows the contours of the hillside and other places it's beautiful and level as though that section had some sort of levelling gear. Of all the forts along Adrian's Wall, Ousteds is one of the best preserved. There's examples of nearly everything here, you know, there's the governor's house, the, the granary, the latrines, This is rather a splendid pillow that I think once upon a time must have supported two arches in what's left of the northern gateway. I mean, the, the beautiful chisel marks still here, you know, it's, it's amazing after all these years, all these centuries, you know. These two towers, one on each side, the, the far one were once the guard room, I've heard tell. I mean, and judging by the thickness of the walls, it must have been maybe 30 or 40 feet high, you know, quite a, a nice bit of building, you know, no wonder really that the things lasted so long. If it was so well built, you might wonder why there's so little left of it today. Well, when the Romans left in about 400 AD, the wall was abandoned and people began to nick bits of stone to build their own walls, farmhouses and even churches and abbeys. But even from what's left today, you can still see how it was built if you look carefully. This really is one of the highlights of the wall fort. The communal bathtub and the communal toilets or latrines. It's rather ingenious how they kept the water in it. You know, there's, there's beautiful grooves chiselled down the ends of each stone and then they poured molten lead down and then of course they'll have corked it up rather like the used to cork the wooden planks in the deck of a ship. The water from the bath came out through this outlet and was channelled into the latrines. And it came round the corner here and it dripped down into this trough here. And then it ran all the full length of the, the toilets and back and back this way and back into the main channel that took away all the affluent. And of course the reason for this trough were while you were sat there on the thunderbox chatting with your mate, you, you wash your sponge in the, in the running water, and then after you'd done that, these two sinks, the rectangular shape, one of the rounded, would be where they washed their hands afterwards, you know. Just what they did with the sponges, I don't know, because all the woodwork and the actual planking, I suppose, with the holes in, is all, of course, gone. But I suppose, it all ran out down the hill where, where the sheep are. And it must have been a bit stinky down there in them days. What's interesting is the way they kept the water in the bath. Yeah. Right, that's it. Uh, that's Ostead Fort, the, the, uh, the Roman baths. The, 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 the way they had of keeping the water in them, you know, there was the storm flags came end to end. They actually cut a groove down the middle and, and of course poured molten lead in like I've just done here. The, the, they would have had possibly to build a, a little pile of stones up at each side with some clay behind to stop the, the molten lead shoving, shoving the clay out, you see. Here I'm a bit lucky because I've got this old moulding box and some sand on each side which will have the same effect. I'll now proceed to dismantle the, uh, the moulding boxes and shift the sand uh, and we'll be able to see uh, just uh, how where the lead is all the way down in the, in the joint, you see, right? Now if we, if they be imagine that, you know, these things were three feet deep and also the hole in the middle or the diamond shaped slot in the middle would stop the, the, the flagstones moving in either direction. Um, my neck, <laughs> it's stuck, <laughs> believe it or not. Look at me, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't expect that. I didn't think that it would have done that. I thought it would have come apart. Um, 
you know, I mean, really, if it were corked up, then it'd definitely be watertight. I think I'll go and build a Roman bath somewhere now. You know, quite good, that. Quite pleased. I didn't expect it. Adrian's Wall only saw active service for about 300 years, you know. Dover Castle here, one of Europe's strongest fortresses, saw action from the Iron Age up to the Atomic Age almost. And here's Ken, who's the general manager, who's going to tell me why it's such a strategic and important spot, you know. I mean, I know for one thing we're high up. <laughs> That's a good start. The reason why it's so important is out there. If you look closely, you can just say, see France. Yeah, yeah. You can see France, they can see us. And if they, want, if they can see us, they want to invade. And this place is really here to protect this country from invasion. Just in case Mr Bonaparte sets out. Well, everybody landed here. I mean, this, mm. is a, this is a natural harbour anyway. You can see the cliffs are quite steep all the way around. And this is really the only place where you can land. Mm. So it's probably all started with, with, with an Iron Age fort. We had an Iron Age fort up there. On top of that, they built a Roman lighthouse. Again, so the Romans, the Romans landed just around the corner from here. Mm. And they wanted to invade and, and, and to go on from there. So we've got a, uh, an Iron Age fort, Roman lighthouse. We've got a big Norman keep, um, World War I, World War II. Mm. It covers the whole period of the history. Yeah, yeah. The keep was built by Henry II in the 12th century, and with a few modifications, it retained a military role right up to 1945. Henry made Dover into one of the most powerful of all medieval castles. Its great strength was due to the successive rings of defensive walls protecting the keep in the centre. This is the uh, the last line of defence. Yeah, like, you, know, you yeah. have to sort of get into the keep itself, mm -hmm. and to get out of here, you've got to go across a drawbridge to yeah. get to the to get to the inner bailey. Yeah. You then got the next wall, which is the which is the inner bailey mm -hmm. wall going around. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the outer bailey, and, mm. and you can see the ditches. The ditches yeah. on both sides go all the way mm. down to the cliffs, mm. yeah, and absolutely. the cliffs are sort of fairly yeah, impregnable once anyway. Got there, you've got three hundred foot of yeah. uh, sheer drop. Well, three hundred feet of cliff. We're at the highest yeah. point now, so there's three hundred feet of, of cliffs, and they yeah. we're about ninety feet high anyway. Yeah. So this is this is the tallest point. Yeah. Get a good view, you can see France very well yeah, now. Yeah. And it was from across that narrow strip of water that the greatest threat always came. So Dover Castle was always heavily fortified and barrack blocks were built all over the place. At the end of the 18th century, when Britain was at war with France, conditions in the castle became very overcrowded. So the Royal Engineers brought in a company of miners to tunnel into the cliffs and create an underground barracks that accommodated over 2,000 men. Yeah. After the end of the Napoleonic Wars, they yeah, were very little the used. Yeah. This is the um, Napoleonic staircase. It's a double helix. Yeah, that means so like this, it's two staircases. Two cases, sort one of one on top, top of the other. other. Yeah. And there's a triple one on the other side of the hill for Western Heights. Yeah. But this is what they And used just the before the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939, they were turned into a bomb-proof command headquarters. Mm. Yeah, that's very really interesting down here. <laughs> this is the command centre for the coastal artillery. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, each of the tunnels had its own use by the different people. The one over there, the one over the next to us was, was the Navy, and Admiral Ramsey had his bit of it in there. Mm -hmm. Corps Command Coastal Artillery in here, mm -hmm. but all the guns and all the radar were all controlled from here. Mm. Yeah, well, I believe the, the gentleman who planned out and mapped out Dunkirk mm -hmm. from somewhere in these tunnels in his little hideaway. The next long tunnel along yeah. on, on, on the other side of the wall here is the Navy's tunnel. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that tunnel, that's where Vice Admiral Ramsey, mm -hmm. he was initially looking after the, the Dover Patrol. He mm -hmm. was looking after the channel and, and sort of controlling all the ships mm -hmm. going through there. Um, he was the one that masterminded the evacuation of Dunkirk. Mm -hmm. Altogether, 338,000 men were evacuated from Dunkirk and over 800 ships brought them back to the safety of Dover. OK, this is the balcony for, this, for the secret wartime tunnels. Interesting thing here is that these are some of the oldest railings in the country. All the railings in World War II were all oh, taken right, and melted down for guns, for but, but, but these were here. But we got pictures of Vice Admiral Ramsey and mm. Churchill and the King coming down here. They would come here because they could see France. This is mm. where they stood and looked out and they could yeah. see the war happening. See the flashes yeah. in the bangs. Yeah. And, and if anything happened and there was something coming yeah. over, then they could nip back into the tunnels yeah. and where it was nice and safe. Mm. 
What makes Dover so important is its location, and the places that castles were built were usually determined by geographical features. There's nowhere you can see this better than in Scotland, so I went up to Edinburgh to see Scotland's most famous castle. Edinburgh Castle stands on the sheer crag of Castle Rock, the core of an extinct volcano. It rises 435 feet above sea level, and it's a pretty formidable natural defence. Really, you couldn't build a castle on better foundations, you know, and so high up. That's the interesting thing, you know, on top of this volcano. I mean, even now, when you're down in town and you look up with, it, with all these escarpments that have been chiselled on the edge of the rock, it sort of, it still looks a hell of a long way up. What it must have looked like before when just this little bit was stuck right on top, you know. You, should have, you can imagine the enemy turning up and just looking up in the sky and saying, sod it, we'll go. In the 15th and 16th centuries, the castle was a royal palace and it became a symbol of royal power. And right up to today, Edinburgh is more than just an historic monument. It still has a symbolic significance and that's why the Scottish National War Memorial is here. One of the most impressive buildings in the castle is this one behind me, you know. It's the Scottish National War Memorial, and it's also one of the most recently built. I mean, I've seen a few war memorials in my time, but believe me, this one takes some licking. Inside this war memorial is this magnificent bronze that, that depicts every aspect of the 1914 war, you know, right from the nurses to the tank regiments and the artillery and the flying machine men the lot. Yeah, the wall, a lot of this bronze were first carved in wood by Alice and Maurice Meredith Williams, he must have been a Welshman. Um, and, and of course, you know, after it had been carved in wood, it would be taken to the foundry and, and used as a pattern to cast the bronze certainly captured the, the the sadness of it all you know there's nobody smiling you know and any of the faces it's all very sad inside the iron caskets at the center of the memorial are the names of 150,000 scots men and women who died in the first world war Military tradition and pageantry are still very strong here. I've seen the tattoo many times on television and I've always been impressed. And when I was on my visit, I had an appointment with a man who keeps another of these traditions going. We're excited now. Hello, yeah. Fred. Yeah, yeah. Hello there, Tom. How are you doing? Very well. This is Tom the Gun, and every day for the last 21 years, he's done that, you know. Why do you do it, you know? Well, it's a tradition that goes back to 1861, Fred. Mm. They started mm. it for shipping in the River mm. Forth, yeah. so uh, ship's captains could set their chronometers. Mm. Yeah, it's a lovely gun, isn't well, it? It's, uh, actually, it was designed in 1936, mm. put into production in 1939. Mm -hmm and been going strong ever since. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Tell you what, I found it quite exhilarating, that build-up to one o'clock then, when I were leaning over there, looking at me watch, you know, it were almost like when, when we're knocking a big chimney down, you know. Same exciting feeling, you know. And give it a, yeah. a good welly, Fred. Will do. I'll do that. Right. Um, <laughs> can you imagine that in 1914? <laughs> you enjoy that? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Mm. 
Yeah, many people on the outside of fireplaces poker stands, don't they? Do they? <laughs> <laughs> From ceremony and pageantry in Scotland, I went to Wales to see an awesome symbol of military domination. Conway is a classic example of the invincible medieval castle. Edward I was by far our greatest castle builder, and his memorial is, is the great chain of eight great stone fortresses that he built here in North Wales in a short space of 25 years. It was the greatest feat of royal building in British history. The castles were a symbol of Edward's power, and they were designed to provide him with an ultimate weapon against any threat of a Welsh uprising. Their defences needed to be very sophisticated, so to carry out the work, Edward employed a Frenchman, James of St George, who was the greatest military architect of his age. And it was in these outposts of English power that the medieval arts of castle building reached its peak. They were all built to withstand any pounding from any siege weapon that had been devised at the time, and it and also made any form of attack difficult and dangerous. There are eight main towers, and but if you look closely, there are four more smaller towers on top of the ones at this end of the castle. These were the king's quarters, and the only way into it, it's really two, two halves, you know, the only way into the king's quarters were by first battling your way through the main body of the castle, and the other way were by sea. As you can see, it would have been a heck of a job to scale these walls, especially with people pouring boiling tar down on you and the likes, throwing all sorts of stuff, bows and arrows. It's not as though you could dig underneath the thing because it's all based on completely solid rock. The structure is a piece of monumental engineering on a grand scale, a massive achievement for its time. And when you look closely at the walls and the towers, you can get some clues as to how the place was built. That, that's a big stone, that. Apparently, when they built these castles, they, they, among, in, in between all the, the, the flat level decks of scaffolding, they have these inclined planes that they actually dragged the rocks up. And of course, it's, it's a bit odd when you study castles and you look at them, there's some of them don't appear to have any putlog holes at all in, that's these little black holes uh, where a piece of timber, a short length of wood called the putlog went in. And of course, tied to the end of it, there were a, a fir poles or tree trunks, for want of a suitable name, and of course, lashed with rope, and then the planks rested on the put logs. They, they just sawed the things off as they were retreating back down again. And then, of course, all castles were nearly all like cement rendered and lime washed. And you can imagine them cement rendering over the end of a bit of wood, and then 500 years later, the wood rotting away, and the some of them look like current cake. There's that many of these potlog holes in them. But what must it have been like to attack one of these places? I went to Warwick for a practical demonstration. Tell us a bit about, uh, you know, how you'd go about getting in here. Well, Master Frederick, you're, you're well within. <laughs> Archer range here. Yeah, I know it looks closer than 200 yards. You, you're taking your yeah. life into your own hands. You should yeah. be wearing a steel helm. Yeah. <laughs> if you look across the crenellations yeah. at the top of the castle, I have my men positioned yeah. in each of the the yeah. archer loops yeah. to look down upon anybody who might yeah. attack the gateway. Once we'd got to the drawbridge, and we presumably they'd have a someone made a wood for shelter behind a bit while they started work on it. Once you'd got that up and got to the port cullis, it'd be a bit tough even then. Well, this actually, uh, Master Frederick, is, is the strongest <laughs> point of the castle, this yeah. barbican here. Yeah. You'd oh, almost be insane yeah. to attack here. Yeah, if you got as far as the port cullis, I think you'd look like a pincushion, wouldn't it? <laughs> you would. <laughs> right, Master Frederick, so now we're, we're actually stood within the barbican itself, yeah. okay. and assuming that the enemy forces had made it through the mighty oaken doors that yeah. rest upon these, these ah. hinges there. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, while they're trying to batter through those, if you look upwards, yeah. you're underneath 
murder holes. Yeah. From which in the floor above, people could pour boiling sand. Yeah, yeah. Or quick in. lime or going, burning oil upon to the attackers. <laughs> but once you've got through this portcullis, there is also doorways surrounding this bottom level of the barbecue. <laughs> The Middle Ages were pretty violent and turbulent times, but for most castles, the last time they saw any real action was at the end of the Civil War, and after that, many of them became palaces and stately homes. Warwick is a good example of the way they changed. It's one of the finest medieval castles in England, but within these very military-looking defensive walls, there's a magnificent country house. By the 1890s, the castle had become a favourite retreat for some of the most important figures in Victorian society. And in some of the castle's rooms, there is a recreation of a weekend house party with a young Winston Churchill on the guest lists. And this is really my period, you know, the beauty and splendour of it all, you know. I'd always like to have been a maintenance man here, you know, it must have been very pleasurable coming to work every morning and fettling bits of furniture up. Now then, I believe you've got a squeaky caster somewhere. Oh, Dibna. Ha. Oh. Uh, remove your cap, please. <laughs> oh, yes. Thank you. Now, would you have a look at this, sir? Uh, oh. I think there's something wrong with the caster down oh, there. right. Hey. Hey. Excuse me, Mr Churchill, <laughs> while I just fettle this here table leg. Coming up tonight on BBC Two, an intriguing whodunit. It's the story of murder on the Victorian Railway at 8.15. Next this morning, Alan Titchmarsh discovers all sorts of urban wildlife in the nature of Britain. <laughs>